most of us fall into one of two categories. Either we are health conscious or we make fun of people who are health conscious. Okay? Um, which are you? Are you somebody that's really you know, conscious about your health or are you somebody that makes fun of people who are conscious about their health? Uh, I, I sort of fall into both categories. I think probably a lot of us do in, in different ways. Uh, I, I am, admittedly, I am health conscious. You know, I, you know, I exercise three or four times a, a week, just mildly, you know, but, but, but I exercise you know, fairly regularly. I, I watch what I eat. I, I just, uh, I don't drink sugar drinks anymore. I mean, you know, used to, it was just because I was cheap, and I'd just get water just because it's cheap, and now, now it's like, even if I'm, I just don't drink Cokes and, and, and you know, sugar drink stuff anymore, I tend to stay away from the really fatty fried foods that I used to, you know, really enjoy, you know, growing up. Uh, the other day, we were at Magic Springs, and the smell of funnel cakes was in the air, and it, it just smelled, smelled delicious, but, but just the thought of eating uh, that sugar-coated lard pastry just, just kind of, it just, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want, want one of those. You know, I, obviously, you know, I've said things have changed. I'm kind of health conscious where I, I didn't used to be so much. But I have relatives. I have people in my extended family. Hopefully they don't hear the recording of this. Uh, I, have, I have relatives in my extended family who are <clears throat> extremely health conscious, okay? When we get together in family gatherings, they will, they'll talk on and on about um, all the terrible stuff that's in the food that we eat. You know, how the, the meat that you buy at the, at the grocery store. We will have fruit there at the, you know, when we, we gather together, fruits and vegetables, but, but that's, that's not good enough. It has to be organically grown fruits and vegetables. No pesticides, no, you know, no antibiotics and food, you know, all, all this. Kind of so, so, you know, if we have fruit there that, well, I don't know if it's been organically grown, well, we have to give it some kind of vinegar wash or something, you know, and make it a little bit more acceptable. And, and they even, even uh, there'll be like a truck that comes to their town. I don't even know how this works or if we have one in, in this area. A truck that comes to town that will come and, and sell all this just super organically, you know, uh, natural stuff, even to the point of like shampoos and soaps. And we're talking about how you know, now that you know all the terrible stuff that's in the shampoo that you use. So they use you know special organic. Now I'm kind of making fun of them and I realize some of you are them and I'm sorry. Uh, but they, like I said, you know, we fall in two categories. We either are health conscious or we make fun of people. And I know good and well that my relatives will probably have the last laugh that 10 years from now, it will be proven that all these things that we, all these normal fruits and vegetables we get at the grocery store are killing us and decreasing our quality of life, and they will be right, and I'll die 10 years earlier. And I, I realize that's probably true, but you know, until that time comes, I'm just going to eat the stuff at the grocery store. You know, I'm just going to do that. That's just the way, way, way I'm going to roll. Um, we all, whether we're very health conscious or not, we do know and acknowledge that what we put into our bodies matters, that it affects us, that, you know, in general, if I eat and drink things that are healthy, then my body in general is going to be a healthier, better functioning body, and that if I eat and drink a lot of stuff that's unhealthy, my body is going to be less healthy, okay? We, we kind of get that. We, we know that. And I don't in any way mean to degrade the importance of bodily health, okay? Because I am I'm a believer in bodily health. Um, uh, I Actually, I, th I think it's a spiritual matter. I don't think we're supposed to be obsessed with our bodies. In fact, I know we're not supposed to be obsessed with our bodies. Yet, our body is the tool that God has given us to do His will on this earth. If I don't have my body... And that's all I've got. That is the tool God has given me to do His will on this earth. And if that body is well-functioning and, and, and working like He made it to work, then I can do His will. And if it's not, then I am diminished in the way I can serve Him. And so I, I just want you to know on the offset, I'm not making fun of the importance of the body because I really do believe in it. However, there, there is a part of us that is, is far more important than our physical body. And, uh, well, the proverb writer, we've been studying the book of Proverbs. We're almost finished with our study through the book of Proverbs. The proverb writer comes to this over and over, and we've kind of come to this over and over as we've looked at the book of Proverbs. But it's this part of us that determines the entire course and the quality of our whole lives. 
And this proverb states it really well. 423. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. You know, we know that when, when he's talking about your heart, he's not talking about the physical organ in our body, but that he's really talking about our mind. Okay, guard your mind, guard the source of your values, the source of your motivations, the source of your uh, cares and concerns and desires, that, that part of you, that's the central who you are, guard that, because everything you do comes out of it. If we take care of our heart, everything else gets taken care of as well. We've seen this before, we've looked at this before together, but what does that practically look like? Okay, what, is it, what does it look like for me to guard, to take care of my heart? And, and, and to, to talk about that, to address that, we're going to look at another proverb. This is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 14. A wise person is hungry for knowledge, while the fool feeds on trash. A wise person is a learner, okay? A wise person loves to gain knowledge. Now, when some of you hear, hear the word knowledge, gaining knowledge, you may think trivia. Some of y'all uh, like the, the game, you know, uh, Trivial Pursuit. I've known families that were just, uh, oh, the, I, was, I joined the Woods family years ago for a game of tri Trivial Pursuit. It was brutal. It was brutal. Uh, you have no idea, I mean, how serious things have been about Trivial Pursuit. But in Trivial Pursuit, you test your knowledge. And it's knowledge about a lot of really important stuff, like... 80s pop stars, you know, uh, professional hockey, you know, all, all these kind of things that are going to do. What is your knowledge about this stuff? And, and honestly, most of it is, is not going to affect your life just a, a, an incredible great deal. When, when the proverb writer talks about knowledge, he's not talking about just knowing facts, knowing stuff about stuff. He's talking about knowing things that 10 years from now matter that knowing the things that 20 years from now matter, knowing things that after your life in this world is through still matters. Here's the way he describes it in a, in a, in a separate proverb, Proverbs 2, 1. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This is the kind of knowledge he's talking about. It's a, a knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. This, this knowledge that he's talking about is the knowledge that God gives. It's not just the knowledge God gives. It's the knowledge of God. Knowing who God is, what God cares about, what God is doing in this world, what his purposes are, and then who we are in him. What our relationship with him is and are we allowing his purposes to, to happen in our lives? You know, I can know a lot about you. Maybe, maybe you might even have a, a book written about you, a biography, and I could read that biography, and I could learn all, a lot about your life, and, and even, even maybe a little bit of what makes you tick and all that kind of stuff, but I don't know you by reading a book about you. I don't know you by learning a lot of facts about you. The only way we know each other is through having a relationship with one another, to actually, actually be together, actually converse, actually be a part of each other's lives. That's the only way that we truly know each other, and that's really, that is the only way we know God. We can know about God. I, I fear that a lot of us think of going to church, going to church in the terms of learning about God. You know, we go to a Bible class, we'll go to this term so we can learn about God. No, Learning about God is important, okay? Learning facts about God, what God is like, who God is, that, that is important, okay? I don't mean to diminish that. But learning about God is nothing unless we learn God, unless we come to know God in, in, a, in a way in which we actually have a real relationship with Him. Knowledge of God is both head understanding. We have to have to have that head understanding, but it's also experience of living life in relationship with him. Whoops, I hit the wrong button, sorry. A wise person. Wise people spend their lives learning who God is, what he is like, what he cares about, how he designed life to be lived, and what his will for our lives is, and getting to know him and walk with him in a relational sort of way. 
So a wise person is hungry for knowledge, seeks out the knowledge of God, seeks out knowledge that matters and that is going to matter for forever. Because when you boil down life to what really matters, when you just boil down, okay, what is it, what is it that I need to know? All that matters is God's character and His purposes and His purposes for our lives, our role in His purposes and our relationship with Him. A wise person understands that. That's what a disciple is. Did you know, you know what the word disciple means? We talk about being disciples of Jesus. A disciple is a learner, a person who is learning from Jesus how to be like Jesus. That's a disciple of Jesus. And the proverb writer would say, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are a wise person. On the flip side, a foolish person is someone who, rather than hungering for real knowledge, feeds on what the proverb writer says, feeds on trash, feeds on, other translations say, folly, meaningless, even harmful stuff. Uh, nutritionists tell us that there are different kinds of food. There is, there is healthy food, you know, food that is good for your brain, good for your body, it helps you function well. There is junk food, which is basically just empty calories. You know, they don't, not necessarily good or bad, you know, they're just, just empty calories. They might cause you gain weight long term, maybe that would be bad, but just empty stuff. But there's also food that has toxins in it. It's also food that is, uh, that is truly bad for you. Uh, bad for you. Of course, you know, I, I told you previously, my, my family thinks most of what I eat is bad for me. But this is, this is true, truly, you know, there's, there's toxic kind of foods that, 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 hurt, that hurt your body. In the same way, we can feed our minds the knowledge of God. We can feed our minds truly healthy things that help us grow and develop as children of God. Or we can fill our minds with just stuff. Maybe stuff that doesn't necessarily have any positive or negative, you know, it's just time filler. It's just stuff. Or we can fill our minds with stuff that's honestly toxic. Brain trash did not begin uh, with modern media, okay? Uh, 3,000 years ago, when this proverb was written approximately, 3,000 years ago, there was plenty of brain trash, okay? You could indulge your mind with gossip, just as you can now. You could indulge your mind with, you know, filthy talk, and uh, various other conversations about things that are, that are unhelpful. Um, there was all kinds of ways to feed your brain trash even 3,000 years ago. But I think you would agree with me now that that has become much more easily accessible to us now. I, uh, this was fr Friday when I was, when I was you know, putting this lesson together, and I was sitting at my computer, and I thought, you know, this would be a, a good point to, uh, to look up some statistics about how much the average American, you know, watches television and gets on the Internet and stuff like kind of that, just to kind of, kind of know that. And I, I expected it to be like, man, the average American watches two and a half hours of television every day and spends an hour and a half on the Internet, you know, and you know, that eats, eats up like five hours of their day is spent, you know, doing this. So, so I, I was expecting that kind of thing. And I was just, as you can imagine, I, I, was, I really was blown away. I, I, it shows my ignorance. Uh, I was blown away because when I actually looked up the statistics on, on this, uh, one study uh, said that the average American, this is an average, okay, an average American watches TV for five hours and four minutes per day. Five hours and four minutes per day. That's I, I, I don't know, that I mean, just boggles my mind. Uh, then the average person I spends on the Internet is like, well, I'm going to say it right, it was like four hours, uh, what was it, 4.3 hours a day on the internet, okay? And if you just kind of just combine all media together, we're talking television, you know, movies, uh, you know, your DVR, DVD, um, uh, internet, all that social media, plus music and stuff like that, that the, the average American uh, consumes 10 hours and 40 minutes of media a day. Now, I, I came out of that study going, when do people work? I mean, you know, when do you work? I mean, it's just like, okay, there's, there's that, and then there's eight hours, and how much time do you sleep? You know, that just, that just seems, seems amazing, but I know a lot of you are going, you just, that's, Brian, that's because you don't have television. You live in a hole. You don't, you don't know what's going on in the world, and that's probably true. Uh, me, me and Aaron ex experienced this uh, about 10 years ago, 
uh, before we started having kids, we, we, we'd had basic cable ever since we got married, and we probably watched you know, a couple hours a night. And, uh, and we just thought, you know, we just want to, as we, you know, Lord willing, bring kids into the world, we just want our, our house to be, you know, not, not to be noisy, not to be distracted, TV going all the time. So we're, we're just going to disconnect cable, and, uh, and we won't have TV at our house. And actually, that, that went fine. It really didn't miss it near as much as I, I thought, thought we would, except during the fall when football season comes, and it drives me crazy. It's like, oh, I would love to watch some you know, live football right now. That's the only time I, I really miss it. But we, we, we did that, you know, like 10 years ago. And about two years after that, we, we were at somebody's house, and we were watching some of the same shows that me and Aaron had, had, had watched when, when we had TV. And... It was, it was just a shocking how unhealthy they were, how ungodly and immoral stuff, and, how, and how, how much really just godless stuff that we had been watching and, and didn't even realize it. And only when we'd been separated from a while did it seem, oh, that's awful. You know, that's just not good. Not good for you. You know, we, we always had this vague sense that maybe that obviously some of the TV we watch is not exactly the most healthy thing. But it, just, just you test this out, okay? And I, I'm talking, we, we're just, these are just shows on ABC and CBS. This is not, these aren't HBO shows that we were, you know, we were watching before. Uh, but you, you, with, you, you cut that out for six months and then watch it, well, especially if you cut that out for six months and replace it with some of the stuff we're going to talk about, and then watch it, and it's like, oh my, how, how, did, I, how, did, how, did, how did I think this was good? You know, it's, it's, it's gonna, it'll happen, I, I almost promise you. Um, but so much of this, these hours and hours and hours of media that we consume, much of it is just what we, empty calories, neither good nor bad, it just fills up Mind space fills up our time. Uh, some of it is, is truly uh, toxic to us. I like to uh, read news on the internet. I've mentioned that before. Um, I spend, spend enough time on the internet you know, myself, and I, I enjoy to, uh, to read news uh, off the internet. And that sounds like a fairly noble thing to look at on the internet. You know, I'm not, not looking at, you know, you know, you know, garbage site stuff. I'm looking at the news. Well, I was, you know, putting this together Friday, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to go to my main, you know, general news site. I'm going to take a screenshot of the, of the front page and just see how much of it is, is important and good and helpful news to know. And that's what I did. I just went to the news site. There was no preparation ahead of time. I went to the news site. I took a screenshot, and I'm just going to share it with you, okay? Uh, the screenshot of my, my news site. And if you can't read all the headlines, I'm going to read these headlines to you, okay? Headlines on the, on the front page. Trump to NRA. You have a true friend in the White House. Michelle Obama says, I wouldn't ask my children to do this again. What happens if a drone hits you in the head? These teams could go quarterback hunting in, in day two of the draft. Judge says gay adoption's not in child's best interest. Michigan teen's body found in grave, arrests made. Missing hiker survived 47 days on salt and water. Jennifer Lopez rocks two scorching hot dresses. Larry Bird resigns as Pacers president. Thousands of Florida Gators removed for bad behavior. Ten retirement stats that will blow you away. The government won't shut down today. Trump says, I thought being president would be easier. What would happen if we killed all the mosquitoes? I actually almost clicked on that one. I wanted to see what that was about. Um, where will quarterbacks land in Mach 2 NFL draft? Best critic slams of Tom Hanks the circle and 10 apps you need on your phone. Now, I had to ask myself, you know, okay, how much of that is helpful real good to know news and how much of it is just junk food and exactly how scorching hot are those dresses <laughs> i'm just kidding about that part um let's go back to this proverb a wise person is hungry for knowledge while the food fool feeds on trash what if all of us uh, just took a, took a Sharpie 
one of those big post-it notes, you know, those old post-it notes, and, and, and wrote this proverb on that post-it note and just stuck it on the corner of our TV. Well, what, what if we took a little smaller uh, post-it note and, and wrote this proverb on it and stuck it on the corner of our uh, computer? What if we uh, wrote this proverb out and put it on the lock screen of our, of our phone? Uh, I wonder what would happen if we, if we read that uh, before we started consuming the media that, that we do, how that would affect us and what we would choose to put in our minds. You and I, I'm, I'm saying you and I, this is, this is me, you and I would like to think that the stuff that we put in our minds, the entertainment kind of things that we, that we put in our mind, it, it doesn't harm us, that, that it doesn't really uh, change the way that we think, that, that it doesn't uh, make us more like the world and less like Jesus. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we're being honest with ourselves. One thing that uh, John Ortberg brought out in the video that we watched here Wednesday night, it was, it was a really good, good snippet, and he was in this easy chair in, 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 a, in a church building, it was, it was, it was kind of cool. He said, you know, if, if all the stuff that we take in is morally neutral, let's just say everything we watched on TV, everything we consume on the internet, it's, it's morally neutral. It doesn't, it's not really good or bad. It's just fine. Um, what about the time that we put into that stuff? What happens to the exciting adventure of life that God created us to live? What happens to our dreams in living out God's purposes for us when we spend hours simply feeding our minds junk food? If we're going to choose wisdom, if we're going to choose wisdom, we've got to consider what it is that we put into our mind. Because the to the person who spends hours a day consuming brain food that is literally junk, the proverb writer says, you're a fool. You're a fool. But if we're going to choose wisdom and change our diet, the brain food that goes into our mind and heart, we can't just cut out the bad stuff, okay? This is an important deal. You may decide, you know, a lot of stuff that I put in my mind is just is not healthy for me. It's not, it doesn't take me uh, in, a, in a good direction. It doesn't enrich my life. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it out. That won't work, okay? That won't work unless you replace it with something that is better. Unless I replace what is Good, what is not good or what is downright evil in my life, unless I replace it with something that is truly good, that is, is better, it's not going to stick. It's not going to uh, get any better. So how do we feed our minds, to, cl to close this with, how do we feed our minds so that we are learning and growing in the knowledge of God and his purposes for our lives? And I'm going to start with uh, what is what's things that we do simply just by ourselves alone, you know, personal, and we'll kind of, kind of expand it out from there. How do you feed your mind in such a way that you come to have a knowledge of God? A knowledge about God, sure, but a true knowledge, a relationship with God. One thing I would encourage, and I, I've, I've said this a few times over the last, last few months because it's just, it's just been weighing on me how important this is. This is a rebellion against what you and I live in our normal lives. We are so used to, with our 11 hours of media consumption a day, we are used to being constantly fed, constantly input. Whenever there's a free moment, it's go to the phone. Whenever there's a free, you know, free hour, sit in front of the TV. There's, there's, there's constant input. Get in the car, listen to music on the radio. I mean, we are, we are constantly, constantly listening to noise. And we don't realize it, but it eats away our soul because we cannot hear our heartbeat. And we certainly cannot hear God's heartbeat when we engulf ourselves in noise. You and I need times where we get alone and we are quiet. 
And we let all that stuff filter through. And we spend time just being with God, talking with Him, and listening. I know this right here, this, this, this would be the most terrifying thing to do for, I think, most average Americans because we are so used to the noise. But you find peace, you find who you are when you step away from the noise on a regular basis and just be with God. Second, this is often uh, partly combined with simply, simply being alone and spending time with God, and that is what I'll call study. I don't like that word because it sounds like school. Uh, we're not talking about school here. We're talking about actively, actively learning, actively seeking, seeking knowledge of God. Um, a lot of that would be simply reading the Bible seeking to understand the Bible, seeking to become familiar with this, this book. Why, why, why do we emphasize the Bible? I mean, why not other books? You know, why, why, because other books are good too. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Why do we emphasize the Bible so much? Here's the reason why I do. The New Testament gets us the closest to Jesus. It, the New Testament is a witness of Jesus and what he said and what he did and what he taught and how that worked out in the early, in the early church. It gets us close to him. And the Old Testament scriptures are the scriptures that Jesus learned and taught and quoted and talked about all the time. So, so the Old Testament scriptures are the scriptures that Jesus valued and that he used in his life. And so because of that, those things, that, those, those are the two main reasons for me, and there's more, tons more reasons we could talk about. But for those reasons for me, that, that book, the Bible, Carries a, carries a much greater weight and to become familiar with it and to, and to, and to hear it, and listen, to, listen to God's word. Because we do, we call it God's word because we, we see how God speaks to us through it. To become familiar with that is just is critical, it's crucial for your life, for your growth in your knowledge of God. Not just knowledge about God, but your relationship with God. Uh, but not just the Bible. Also spending time learning uh, things based on the Bible. I, I uh, you know, when I, when I exercise, I put on a, uh, some kind of lecture or sermon or something like that on the Internet. Hey, you know, the Internet has some good stuff, okay? Uh, I, I stream that stuff off the Internet while I work out. Uh, sometimes when I'm folding clothes or washing dishes or something like that, I'll put, put, my, put my little iPad up there and, and, and put on some, some lesson that I can just absorb your good stuff while I'm doing something that otherwise would be a pretty mindless task. But, but uh, learning, being a person who is a learner, is you aren't living if you aren't learning. Learning is an essential part of what human beings were created to do. We are learners. We are meant to be learners. So, so study is, a, is an important part. Now, we also do study together as a group. Part, what we are doing at this moment is a form of study, okay? So we do that in groups as well as alone. But, but you can't substitute uh, doing it uh, alone because that is really important. I tried to think of a less churchy word than this, okay? Because this is a really churchy word, but I couldn't think of one. And because all the other words start with an S, I wanted to think of one that started with an S. Sorry, I didn't, couldn't think of it. Fellowship is the best way I, I could describe this. And even it really falls short because a lot of us, we call things fellowship that aren't actually fellowship. Fellowship is not saying hi to each other in the foyer of the church and making small talk. Okay, fellowship isn't talking about football and shopping and kids and, and hunting and, and whatever else that we talk about. Small. Now that stuff is important. It's important for us to be able to make small talk with one another, talk about stuff, get to know one another. That's, that's all good. But that's not really fellowship, okay? Fellowship, when we talk about it, biblically speaking, is, is a lot deeper than that. Fellowship is the building of a relationship that is based on your common relationship with God, okay? Fellowship is the building of a relationship that is based on your common relationship with God. It is a partnership. 
It is a recognizing that, that we are partners in it. We are working together on this. Let me tell you, this afternoon when we're working together, you know, doing cleaning and, and, and making stuff and all that kind of stuff over, over in that building, that now, that's going to be a, a form of fellowship. We're actually going to be working together for a common cause that's a God cause, okay? That's fellowship. Simply making a small talk is not it. Um, now, Here's a, here's a real problem that, that we have, and this just kind of just dawned on me the other day. We, when we become Christians, most of us, I think, when we become Christians, we skip right to this, to fellowship, okay? When we think, okay, I'm going to become a Christian, now I go to church. Now I'm a part of a church. And we, when we become a Christian, often... We think we go to the church expecting the church to provide us with all that we need, with what we need spiritually. Man, you know I'm a Christian now, and so now I go to the church for, for the for the for the for the church to supply my spiritual needs. And then we get involved with the church and we realize that the church is filled with immature Christians just like us. And we expect them, and they're expecting us. We expect them and they're expecting us to fulfill a spiritual need that we don't even have figured out ourselves. And so we come to the church and become very frustrated, become very, very, very just disillusioned with church because here the church is supposed to do this for me and, and, and they're expect you know, and, 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 and it, it, didn't, it doesn't happen. You probably have experienced that at some point. You may be in the middle of that right now. If we don't come to God and realize that our faith is not, the center of our faith is not in the church. The foundation of our faith is not in the church. The foundation of our, of our faith is in Jesus and our relationship with Him. And that if our relationship with God is growing, our personal relationship with Him, and we are people who are learning and we are growing, then we are able to come together with other Christians and help them and help each other and sharpen each other because fellowship is about sharpening each other, stretching each other, helping each other grow, joining one another and doing this God thing together because your relationship with God is not just about you and God. My relationship with God is about us and God. But if I expect the us to fulfill my needs, I'm going to fail, and I'm going to feel like everybody else failed as well. If I am growing in my personal relationship with God, and you are growing in your personal relationship with God, and as we come together, we seek to help each other and sharpen each other and work together, then the church actually becomes what it was designed to be. See, if I come to the church asking the question, is the church fulfilling my needs? Is the church taking care of my spiritual needs? That is the wrong question. However, if I go to the church saying, am I growing in my relationship with God? And am I helping others? Am I helping other Christians, other believers grow in their relationship with God? Am I helping them stretch? Am I giving them something that they need? Am I blessing other Christians around me? Now, if all of us are doing that, if we're coming to the, church, to the church, to the body, with the question of how am I helping those around me, then the church will truly be what God intends the church to be. We can't skip right to the fellowship because then everything breaks down. We start with God and our relationship with Him, and then the church becomes what it's intended to be. Finally, now, there's, there's much more. I'm just giving categories here. There's much more to this than, than we're talking about this morning. But the last part I wanted to talk about is that we seek a knowledge of God. Here we go. There it comes. Through service. We learn through doing. Not just solitude, not just study, not just fellowship. We learn by putting what we are learning into practice. I'll pick uh, Josh over here, Josh Johnson, he, he puts windshields in cars. I'm going to assume, Josh, that you didn't just read a manual on how to do that and then you were able to do it, or watch a video even and be able to do it. I would imagine that Josh had to learn to do that by actually 
installing windshields, and probably a bunch of them, right? You know, there's a lot of different kinds and all this stuff, and probably is still learning to this point. Um, uh, some of you are teachers. Drew, you're a teacher. And I, I'm assuming that, that, that Drew probably went, you went to college to learn to be a teacher, right? Okay, you went to college to learn to be a teacher. Took a lot of classes on being a teacher. Now, when he was dropped into that class, did he know how to do it? Probably in some ways, yes. And in some ways was equipped to do that. Those classes were helpful and everything. Man, you don't know how to do it until you start doing it, right? You learn through actually putting into practice what you're learning. You don't know something until you are doing something. A lot of us were really great parents before we became parents. I mean, we knew what we were going to do and what we were not going to do and how this was going to work out. And you find out that, boy, I really don't know much until I'm actually doing it, right? We learn what we do. An essential part of learning is putting into practice what it is that we learn through our solitude, through our study, through our fellowship together, through all the various ways that God speaks into our lives. We don't learn it until we start doing it. As we serve, as we serve people, as we put into practice the blessing of other people's lives, we learn knowledge of God. Not just about God but a relationship and knowledge of him. And it's something that we can share. So let me ask you this question as we close. What's your ministry? What is your ministry? One thing that we've, we've done that's been very harmful is we have called certain people ministers. Okay, we call it typically those who are paid that, that part of their livelihood or all of their livelihood is, is working in the church or with the church, or, and we, we call them ministers. And they have a ministry. And we have failed to realize that there is no such thing as a category of people called minister. That every Christian, every person who becomes a follower of Jesus, is a minister, is a servant, is a part of the body of Jesus doing the work of Jesus on this earth. So what is your ministry? In what way is God working through your life to do His work in this world? I want you to ask yourself that question. If, that's, if that question is hard for you to answer, this, that's not judgmental. I figure that question is hard for a lot of us to answer, okay? And if it is, if that's hard for you to answer, I want to ask you to be praying about that, to be asking, to be pondering on that. What is my ministry? What is my role in God's kingdom on this earth? How am I to serve? And as we close up uh, this book of Proverbs and we start some, some new things, I, I hope to, to be of some help in helping us find our ministry because you were created for a purpose, for many purposes. You were created to do the work of Jesus in this world in a way that only you can do it. God has a plan and a purpose for you to do in this, wor- in this world, and you are going to bless the world as you find your ministry and as you do it. So this morning, I want to encourage you to turn your back on the foolish, the foolish use of your time. I'm not saying don't relax ever. I'm not saying don't ever watch any TV. I'm not saying you need to cut. Yeah, I'm not saying you need to be like me and not have TV at your house. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not saying, but I'm saying that you need to think about the way that you use your time. And yes, relax. Yes, have some time where you are resting. But reduce the garbage time. Take out the foolish use of your time. Spend some of it in quietness. Disengage yourself from the noise. Spend some time learning of God, actively learning what God has to say to you. Spend time in not just being around other people, but sharpening other Christians, helping each other to grow. And as you learn, don't just learn. Because if you just learn in your head, you haven't learned it. You haven't learned it until you do it. So go and begin to put into practice what it is that you're learning. Find your ministry and and go do it. What kind of food will fill your brain? What kind of food 
will fill your brain. Your answer to that question will to a great degree determine the course of your entire life. Let's pray.